Hebrews, verse by verse, a new and living way. This is part 27. And we're up to Hebrews chapter 7. 27 weeks, halfway through the book. And really one of the hardest chapters, I think, in the book. And the title is... All other attempts to reach God are made obsolete with the coming of Christ. All other attempts to reach God are made obsolete with the coming of Christ. I'm going to read, don't usually take this large a block, 16 verses. If you have your Bible in some form, please follow along. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, meant Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, this is Melchizedek, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, the meaning of his name. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. I'll talk about that. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Verse 4. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law, that's the law of Moses, to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descendants descended from Abraham. Six. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Abraham had the promises from God. It is beyond dispute that the inferior, Abraham, is blessed by the superior, Melchizedek. Eight. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. It's all the Levites and the tithes paid to them. But in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. I know you're thinking, please, Pastor Don, wrap up this text. Verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. Melchizedek wasn't a descendant of Abraham or the tribe of Levi. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. We sing it, right? The Lion of Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Like, there's nothing in the law about priests being allowed to come from the tribe of Judah. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Let's pray. Help us, Lord Jesus, as we work through this text. Holy Spirit. You put this text here. It's important for our study. Guide us from error. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If I were a betting pastor, I'm not, I would bet a year's pay. That's over 5,000 bucks. That there isn't a congregation anywhere in Canada using Hebrews 7 for their text this morning. It's a, it's a clunky, awkward text. It doesn't flow. It doesn't feel poetic, engaging, or even immediately relevant. So why on earth did the Holy Spirit, the one Jesus described as the divine teacher, why, why did he breathe out such a cumbersome string of sentences for a church like Cedarview? In 2017. Here, here's my goal this morning. Why do any of us need to know a whiff about Melchizedek? And I want everyone to leave church 
feeling almost surprised, like, like they were inwardly saying, oh, okay, so, so that's why those verses matter, and I have two Sundays to make that happen. I've chosen a big block of text to work through, so we're going to jump right into it. Point number one. Melchizedek is referenced in this spirit-inspired text to help us understand the contrast between the old covenant priesthood and the ministry of the Christ. And, and here's why that matters. Here's why that matters. There have always been and still are dozens of religions claiming access to God. There are prophets, leaders, teachers, angels, priests, high priests in abundance. What, what gives any one religious belief the right to claim supremacy over the others? Like, that's not an irrelevant question. There could hardly be a more important question, and, and that's what this cumbersome text is addressing. Priesthood. Priesthood in any religion is all, it's all about getting to God. Priesthood is all about access to God. And our writer, the writer of Hebrews, just picks one such religion, thoroughly endorsed all through the Old Testament, Judaism. And he uses that as an example of how the coming of the Christ makes religion without Christ or outside of Christ obsolete. In fact, he will use that very word, obsolete. And he quite strangely uses this mostly unknown name, Melchizedek, to make his point. Those first ten verses, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And then it says in verse 2 that to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Abraham gives Melchizedek the tithe, the tenth. Then we get that explanation of his name, the last part of verse 2. Then in verse 3, he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. When our writer starts chapter 7 with this sentence, verse 1, for this Melchizedek, that's the first verse, when he says, this Melchizedek, that's the clue that this is not the first time he's mentioned him. You can see it up here. Hebrews 5, 6. For he, God, says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 5, 10. Talking about Jesus being designated by God as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 620, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the key point in each of those texts is, is this unknown priest, Melchizedek, is, is repeatedly, at least those three times, he's linked up with Jesus. He's not the same as Jesus, but he, he illustrates Melchizedek is being used by our writer as a type of the priesthood Christ accomplished. But why does he pick Melchizedek? What's so special about the priestly ministry of Melchizedek that he is selected as a picture of our Lord? I mean, three times in three verses. 5, 6, 5, 10, 6, 20. He repeats this phrase that Jesus is a high priest after the order. After the order of Melchizedek. After the order. After the order of Melchizedek. Three times. 
He means that Jesus is a priest along the lines of Melchizedek, after the pattern of Melchizedek. It's not as complicated as you might think. There are two unique features about Melchizedek. First, he wasn't a descendant of Aaron. He wasn't of the tribe of Levi, as all the Old Testament priests were commanded by God to be. He wasn't. And the second feature is, he has no traceable ancestry in the Old Testament. And and I want you to see why both of those features are the theme of Hebrews chapter 7. So first, Melchizedek wasn't in the Levitical priestly line. Like, think about that. Melchizedek is the first priest named in the Bible. The very first one. And every other priest, all those offering, all those sacrifices, all those offerings in the Old Testament, every one of them, they were Levites in the family line of Aaron. So no king, no prophet, no leader could take the priesthood upon himself. The Levitical priesthood was prescribed by law through Moses. And this is what our writer is driving at in that fifth verse. Do you see it? The fifth verse in chapter 7, he says this. And those descendants of, descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people. That is from their brothers, though these also are descendants from Abraham. Melchizedek, he's outside all of that. He's an outsider to the whole Judaic covenant. He doesn't fit into the Old Testament law at all. And yet he's specifically called, 7-1, priest of the Most High God. Like, just think about what's being said here. You've, You've probably struggled. You're working your way through the Bible. We're all reading the Bible through this year. And you get, you get to Leviticus and you just sort of pray for strength. Even numbers. All that endless, repetitive detail about, about every, every minutia of the construction of, of the, the, the tabernacle. And every conceivable rule of animal sacrifice. Which part of the liver you can offer and which part of the kidney you can't. And all of these, all of these things. Everything about... The purification of sinners and all the washings. And woe betide anyone who ignores any of those divine instructions. And then, the very first priest named in the Old Testament isn't of the family of Aaron. He isn't a Levite. He isn't a descendant of Abraham. He isn't Jewish. No. And yet... And yet, the writer of Hebrews tells us Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. It's shown in, in, in two ways in the text. First, Melchizedek blesses Abraham rather than Abraham blessing Melchizedek. You can see that, by the way, in Hebrews 7. 1 and 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, meant Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. This is Melchizedek blessing Abraham. Then he says, just in case we don't get it, 7, it is beyond dispute. The inferior is blessed by the superior. So his, he doesn't leave us doubting what his point is. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham in two ways. He blesses Abraham. And the second thing is, Abraham offers the tithe of the spoils of battle to Melchizedek. That's in verse 2 and verse 4. And to him, that's Melchizedek, this him, Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He, Melchizedek, is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. See how great this man, this is Melchizedek, this man, was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. The only brief record we have of this event, where Abraham meets Melchizedek and gives him a tenth, 
It's in Genesis 14. You don't need to look it up. 17 to 20. So after defeating these, this amalgamation of invading kings from the east, and he liberates his nephew Lot, Abraham, on his way back, he happens upon Melchizedek, and he offers him a tenth of everything that he took in the battle. So you need to remember where we are. I know this is not a light text. I said there were two prophetic pictures contained in the priesthood of Melchizedek. And our writer wants to identify these features when he says Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. The first feature was Melchizedek transcended the Mosaic law, the boundaries of the Levitical priesthood. He's a priest from the outside. He's of another order altogether. Now the second feature, our writer gives us a clue in the third verse. Here's the th second thing about Melchizedek. He's greater than Abraham. But verse 3 says he's without father or mother. This is the important word, genealogy. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, resembling, not the same, resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, just to be clear, our writer doesn't mean Melchizedek was an eternal being just as God the Son. Melchizedek wasn't divine. What our writer means is, you can scan your Old Testament, your Bible from beginning to end, use any computer program that you want. And there's no record. There's, there's no genealogy. Nothing about his lineage. There's no record of his birth. There's no record of his death. In other words, he has, he has the legal look of one without a beginning and one without an ending. There's no data revealed on those things. So, so what is being revealed about our high priest, Jesus, the Christ, through these two features of Melchizedek? What, why are we laboring a whole chapter over this comparison with Melchizedek? Our writer is showing us that the whole Old Testament priestly sacrificial system wasn't the ultimate system. It was important for its time, but it was passing and it was provisional. It was divinely commanded, to be sure, but, but it was a human system to the roots. It sprang from a completely human genetic tree. It only pointed to what was yet to come. Descendants of Abraham, Aaron, the Levites, it just passed along that genetic line. In linking Christ with Melchizedek, our writer is proving that that, that whole Levitical priesthood was divine, divinely designed to point to something powerful, ongoing, permanent more deeply effective. The Levitical system was the lesson, the preamble, getting the world ready for love's great redeeming work, and all that missing genealogical data from Melchizedek is, is pointing to the entry of the yet to come, divinely spirit conceived from the outside, the incarnate coming high priest, and all earthly religious systems, here's the point. All earthly religious systems must be forced into obsolescence in light of God incarnate and the eternal life in Christ. And those worshipful tithes that Abraham gave, they, they point to the fact that just as Jesus himself said... Remember when Jesus said, one greater than Abraham is here. And 
And he would one day create a redeemed people of God from every race on earth, far beyond the lineage of ethnic Abraham. So to put it another way, God was revealing that just as, just as the first priest named in the Bible bypasses and transcends the entire Levitical system, so will the last great high priest do the same. Point number two. I say point number two, but we're well over half done, so don't panic. We need to remember the priestly work of Christ or we will remain in religious and moral bondage. Just want to look quickly at 11 to 16 of chapter 7. Here's the topic. Now if, oops, I did it again. Now if perfection, this is what he's talking about, had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need, here's the question, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron. They already had those. They had priests after the order of Aaron. Oodles of them. For when there is a change in priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law. What he means is, Melchizedek wasn't of the tribe of Aaron, descendant of Aaron, a Levite, nor is Jesus. So the, the law obviously has changed with these priests. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Continue. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. Do you see what he's saying? Obviously this law about the Levitical priesthood has changed because Jesus wasn't from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. Moses didn't say anything about Judah. So the law has changed, he's saying. Moses said nothing about priests, about that tribe. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. Who's that talking about? The one in the likeness. Say it out loud. That's Jesus, right. Who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, tribe of Levi, but, but by the power of an indestructible life. The whole idea of these six verses is, is set up by the question of our writer. And boiled down to its essence, the question of verse 11 is this. If the old covenant Levitical priesthood worked, if it was sufficient, why would we need another coming priest after the order of Melchizedek? That's the issue. If the Levites descended from Abraham actually brought perfection before God, like priests are supposed to do, then why is any further work necessary? And the simple answer to that question seems, seems obvious. The work of Christ on our behalf is greater and it's deeper than any earthly priesthood in any religious system. That's true. That's true. But, it, but it's kind of a weak answer because it, it begs another question. How, how do I know? How do we know Christ accomplished a greater and deeper work? How do we know? And that's where our writer wraps up his argument in today's text. But it's buried in some details and you have to sift it out. The problem with the Levitical priesthood and all earthly religious endeavors is those descendants of Aaron had one thing in common. They all died full of their own sin and full of their own mortality. They all died, every one of them, full of their own sin and full of their own mortality. 
you can see our writer working this contrast when, when he was referring to the tithes that Abraham gave Melchizedek. It's right back in verse 8. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, right? But in the other case, by one of whom it testifies that he lives. Of course, as we've already seen, Melchizedek wasn't actually eternal. But he's pictured. He's pictured in eternal terms by bursting on the scene with no traceable genealogy at all. But the priest our writer has in mind, the one symbolized by Melchizedek, that's different. In contrast to all earthly priests who did their legal assignment and then faded off the scene, our Lord, the one after the order of Melchizedek, he rose from the dead, conquering all of those still to be paid heavy wages of sin. Nobody else did. Nobody else took care of the problem. Until, praise God, until one final priest, not a Levite appointed by a Mosaic law, one final priest offered one final sacrifice, and the sacrifice paid off all of this fallen world sinful debt. And we know this payment was sufficient. We know our eternal future is safe with this priest because his priesthood didn't end with his death like all those descendants. We know sin was finally pardoned because death was defeated. This priest still lives. His priesthood is still effective, still purifying on my behalf because I need more than just to know I was saved in 1962. And that the record of my sins up till that point was cancelled. I need grace today. I imagine you do too. And I need a priestly work that continues, not one that's rotting in a grave somewhere. This is the difference Jesus makes. Verses 15 and 16... The best verses in the world to leave a church service on. This priest. This becomes even more evident with another, when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. Now he's talking about Jesus. Who has become a priest. Not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent but by the power of an indestructible life. No wonder earlier he said, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul that enters in behind the veil, right to the presence of God. And Jesus is right there at the presence of God for me now. I don't have to stand in my own righteousness. That hope is my anchor. That hope is my anchor. Either Jesus is your high priest or your religion is obsolete. Either Jesus is your risen Savior and Lord or your religion is obsolete. There's no one who can take his place. And there's no one who can put you in touch with Father God. Everyone said? Let's pray together.